Liza Dyer, CVA, and many other wonderful things. Welcome to Priceless Advice with Leaders of Volunteers. Yay! Thank you so much, Dana. It is an honor and a joy to be here. I am not fully caught up watching all of your interviews, but I'm just always so impressed with how you highlight the brilliance in the field of volunteer engagement. So it's an honor to be here. Yay. Well, you know what? It's not a requirement of guests to see every single episode because that's many dozens, if not hundreds of hours, I think, at this point. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you're off the hook for that. And uh, because you are an expert, as everyone who knows you knows, in technology for volunteer engagement, latest tech trends, and that's kind of the theme of our priceless advice and your Tuesday tips today. I dusted off my good old nerdy video game Pac-Man sweater. There's my Pac-Man sweater. So uh, perfect. Yeah, slightly understated, classy, yet clearly in this fun geek nerd zone in which uh, we live all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I really like how it can transition from daytime wear to nighttime wear. It really, you know, it's an everyday, every night sort of deal. So Liza, the last time we saw each other in person, <laughs> when the world could see each other safely in North America in person, which was a, a while ago, we're in 2020 now, it was 2019 in Toronto in October for the Alive and VMPC and Better Impact hosted hybrid conference. And you being the tech expert that you are, and very well known for that, uh, you were talking about, we were kind of talking about some, some tech trends and updates and my goodness has your expertise been in demand and in need for what we've done in 2020. Do you want to speak to some tech pivoting success or failures that you've noticed in the volunteer engagement sector in the last year or so? Absolutely. I think what's really interesting is that even though at the uh, Alive and VMPC and Better Impact, got to get all the names in there, conference that, uh, you know, I was talking about artificial intelligence, but the thing that was really the central thing there is that artificial intelligence isn't just going to take the place of people, you know, and just like technology is not taking the place of people or personal interaction or, you know, human interaction now. And what we've really seen uh, you know, locally and globally is that even though, yes, we have all this technology at our disposal and we're adapting to it a lot faster than we might have otherwise been on the path to do so before a pandemic, that we still really want that human connection. And so one of the examples that I can speak to with that is that uh, at my organization, Multnomah County Library in Portland, Oregon, we have an adult literacy program where we're doing one-on-one -on -one tutoring and pre-pandemic, we did that in person, sitting next to each other and having that personal connection. You know, when somebody is an adult learner and they're, they're feeling, they're vulnerable, right? Because they're trying to learn something and they're partnering with the tutor. And um, so we were able to pivot that to an online format and it is still very successful. And, you know, I wish I could take all the credit for that, but that is really my incredible colleague who just said, all right, we're doing this pandemic. Let's just continue to serve the community and meet them where they are, figure out what they need and how we can, how we can do that. And then the volunteers were like, yeah, let's do it. You know, so, um, you know, we, we didn't enable all of the volunteers to stay involved because some of them were like, you know what, I, I'm too zoomed out, but it was a really great pivot for our organization. Um, and there's just been so many other examples at other organizations that I've seen as well. So I think that people were, you know, understandably challenged, but I've seen incredible, incredible growth in our, in our field and everything since then. Definitely. And I've, <laughs> I've been using the term zoomed out quite a lot <laughs> the last year. I, I feel like, you know, me in my career and individually in the work that I've been doing last couple of years, I started working for myself from home in 2019 using Zoom and other and WebEx and other platforms 
So I felt like, oh, this wasn't really that much of adjustment for me. And I've had so many, you know, pro bono advice or, or paid clients where there's this technophobia that people have and they don't realize that it's there in themselves or in the culture or in the leadership of their organizations until some th a crisis like this hits that requires a pretty steep learning curve of adopting technology, teaching it to people. Um, it's great that when it was in person, your, your group with um, your library was able to adapt pretty, pretty easily. And it's also important to remember, and we were kind of pre-chatting before we set this up, that technology is a tool in a toolbox and not a solution in and of itself. Do you want to talk about how to avoid tech solutionism and kind of assess or evaluate or address the, the real needs of whatever's going on? Absolutely. Yeah. So as a, uh, the often the token millennial in any work group throughout my life, I was also uh, really into tech solutionism. So I just have to say that that is where I was coming from was technology is so cool. I love it. You got a problem. There's an app for that. Right. And I think that is really exciting. And that's always the you know, the, the novel thing, right, is what technology can I use to solve this problem? So I just want to say that that's, that's where I came from was the excitingness of, of technology. But as I have learned more about technology and also like, hey, it is just a tool, you know, so um, let's not treat it as the be all end all of everything. You know, this technology is not going to save us from certain doom, whatever our missions and our organizations are addressing, but it's, it's a way that we can, uh, you know, automate our processes. It's a way for us to keep track of information. It's a way for us to put the power into the hands of our volunteers, say, to set their own schedules through whatever system we're using, perhaps. It's a way for them to be able to access their own information, have, um, have the authority over what information is in our databases, for example. Um, and I think it's really just a matter of finding what's a right fit for your organization and for your volunteers and for your staff. I cannot tell you the number of times that I hear from somebody, oh, you have to use this database. And it's like, well, okay, one, we can't afford that because you know, maybe we don't have the same type of budget. Uh, and also not every tool is going to fit the need for every situation. And so I think that's really just important to keep in mind that, you know, even though technology can be exciting, you actually want to get some people on your team that are not enthusiastic about the shiny new technology, right? So, um, that's another thing we were talking about was finding your, your stakeholders, right? Totally. And, yeah. and so there's, you know, I always say like, um, criticism is a form of collaboration. So find that person who's going to criticize the technology. You want to know the problems with it up front, right? You don't want to yeah. wait until you release it and then find out that, oh, actually half the group you're trying to use it with really hates it. And now they, you know, feel like you didn't even consider their feelings or, or their perspective about whatever that tool is. Yeah, and getting buy-in. And it's such an important point. I make the point in High Tech, High Touch uh, webinar that's always changing and getting updated that the tool in the toolbox is, and the needs assessment is really where you start. And that's what you were talking about. But you might need a bicycle version of technology, you know, or a horse. You might need something that is just very simple and is going to last forever and not need a lot of maintenance and not be super complicated. That's easy for people to, to use or they're already used to using. Or you can go to, you know, a nice Honda or Subaru car, kind of middle of the road, does most of the things you need it to do, nothing fancy. Or the Lamborghini. And most of the time I get, I don't know, I get so many calls from <laughs> volunteer app developers and new VMS companies, uh, and I'm sure you do too, where they're like, I, you know, there's an app for that, but like, I have an idea to, to reinvent how we recruit volunteers. And like, okay, well, can you build a better mousetrap? And does anybody care? Do we need that? I love this idea that you're talking about of that some of your stakeholders are also like your skeptics. 
and your critics. Um, mm -hmm. And have you seen some of the skeptics or critics then be like the most enthusiastic adopters or tra then training other people when they do find something that they really like? You know, I wouldn't say the most enthusiastic, but I went from <laughs> making a colleague cry with trying to speed too fast into this amazing technology solution and having that person feel just so incredibly overwhelmed. Um, I hadn't taken into account all the other technological changes that had happened within our organization at that time that they were, they were not only fatigued with technology, they were burnt out on it. And I was mm. just asking way too much of them. So, but with that person, you know, fast forward a couple of years, they actually came back and they were like, you know what? Um, I want to learn how to do this. So I would sit next to them and they would write down in their notebook because that's how they learn is by writing things down. Mm -hmm step-by-step step how to do something because they're like, I don't want you to always have to explain this to me. I want to be able to do this for myself. And so then when we ended up using a different tool, they were actually like tagging me on something and I didn't even know how to do that. They had figured it <laughs> out. And <laughs> like you, you like, you tell me, man. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like they had figured out some way to tag me in some project management sort of software that we were using. And, and I was like, I, how did you even do that? And, and they were just surprised that I didn't know. But then they were trying not to gloat too much, I think, which <laughs> I loved because I was just so proud. <laughs> Yay. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think, I think part of that, too, is helping people understand what technology can and can't do. And sometimes when somebody doesn't like something that we're using, it's because it doesn't work for them. And right. so, you know, I universal want those. design, thinking about universal yeah. design, which we also like chatted about before this call. Exactly, exactly. And so, you know, figuring out what doesn't work for them, but then also through that process, bringing them along as opposed to just saying, oh, no, we can't do that. But let's bring them along. Let me demo this with them and figure out, why why it's not working for them and maybe it's just wow that is a great feature it doesn't currently exist yet and hey maybe i can talk to the software developer if that's the sort of situation we're in or maybe i can go look for some other um option because yeah the you know as we're going through and using technology more and more i'm like you know what i know that this technology works for X percentage of people that I'm working with, great. I don't need to talk to those people. I already know what's going to work because I have, you know, however many years of experience working with that group. I want to talk to the three squeaky wheels, right? The, you know, the people who are just always like, this doesn't work for my volunteers, you know, uh, or the volunteer that says, I don't know why you do it this way. The other organization I volunteer with does it differently and I like it better. And I'm like, okay, I want to talk to you about that. And that's mostly just about listening to them because I, I'm the one who needs to sit back and hear what doesn't work for them. And also that, that change management, really. I mean, that's, that's the nitty gritty of it is if you're adopting any new platforms, apps, tech, volunteer management software, VMS, what have been your kind of tips and tricks for managing that transition in that process, in addition to talking about, okay, listen to the squeaky wheels, but like, where do you go from there? Yeah, that's a great question. One of the things that I've been going through with uh, trying to get our IT department to okay our use of a new technology is that I go to them and I say, hey, this is what I have done research on. I've talked to other organizations, both locally that are not libraries, so not like our organization, but I've also talked to libraries in other states and, you know, in Canada as well. And so here's, here's my research. And then IT comes back and says, oh, that's great. Uh, you know, have you tried these other ones? Have you demoed those? And I look at them and I say, no, because everybody that I've talked to did not suggest them. Or they said, yeah, we use them and now we don't, and here's why. Yeah. And so I think having those relationships with other organizations is key. You know, it's, it's the part of that human aspect of technology. So, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. How do you sweet talk your IT people? Because that can, that can be a stereotype of introverted or um, socially, even more socially awkward than you or I in our 
video game attire. <laughs> uh, like, do you have what have what's worked for you in even approaching that conversation? Hmm. Really good question. For me, it's kind of a very specific example, which is okay. that uh, we were using an appointment setting software to schedule phone interviews with volunteers so that we don't have the back and forth of, oh, let's talk about volunteering Tuesday at two. Oh no, Tuesday at two doesn't work for me. Okay, so like how many things can you schedule online? And even more so through the through the pandemic, right? And so I had already worked with a company locally that did that. And as my organization was trying to expand that to do uh, library materials pickup, they were like, oh, how do we schedule this? And my name somehow got to IT that, oh yeah, Liza Dyer works on this one thing and you should see what she has to say. So then I had a meeting with our, you know, director of uh, I don't know, strategic technology, whatever the amazing title is, and our IT person, and I demoed it for them. And I, you know, did a screen share and I said, here's, here are the basics. And then they got to ask questions. And at the end, our IT person said, have you ever worked in IT? <laughs> and I said, nope. <laughs> and so then a couple months later is when I went and requested this new software. So I don't know if that kind of helped pave the way, but it's, you know, I, I've done the research. I know what I'm doing and you just have to go in there and be willing to answer all the questions. And oftentimes with software companies, if you're doing a big uh, contracting process, they'll have somebody there who's an advisor and they can help to create that connection and answer all the IT questions that you may not know about. Yeah. So that can definitely be a huge help, somebody to help you navigate that process. I, I've had a couple of really funny email chains or even close to cold calls or people reaching out usually through LinkedIn, but sometimes they go through my website or they just email me directly where it's, you know, you and I know and talk to and are friends with and go to conferences with and run in the same circles as the founders and CEOs of every volunteer management software company in North America. <laughs> We, I know these people personally, I've done karaoke with most of them <laughs> at some point <laughs> over, over the years. You've had conversations with them. You know, we've been hosted by Binner Impact events, uh, Visus, Samaritan, uh, you know, all, all of these volunteer match, Points of Light, all, all of these kind of big players. And every once in a while, when it's not some stranger trying to do a startup app, it's a new sales rep that's been hired pretty far down the food chain in these companies reaching out to me. <laughs> and I'm like, say hi to Jennifer or Greg or Tony for me. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, no, I'm on board. I get it. If, if I think your VMS fits, you know, the situation that I'm helping somebody with and I absolutely will, will recommend it. And I, I talk about certain ones, not as a salesperson, but um, you know, just for like a pretty neutral comparison and high tech, high touch. And, you know, I'm not throwing them under the bus or trying to humiliate anybody, but it's usually good for a little giggle. And if they have a sense of humor and they're not too mortified, it starts a couple little inside jokes back and forth. And uh, it's, but yeah, it's like, it's not, it's a small world. It's a small sector that we're in and it's a really niche market. So having the resources from you and your suggestions and your blogs and your articles or me or somebody else to to find the right fit. And we were also kind of mentioning in our, our emails and chats beforehand of how do you find the tech that you don't even know what it's called or if it exists? Because I, I tell people that these exact databases designed for a sector exist and it blows their mind. They are like, mm -hmm. it does what now? I don't just have to use an Excel sheet or Google Sheets. What what exists? Mm -hmm. So can have you ever like just distilled that down into other than like Googling or Ask Jeeves or use a search engine um, or DuckDuckGo or whatever? How do you how do you kind of face that with people who who don't know what they don't know and how to ask for it? <laughs> yeah, that, that's awesome. And I have to say, what you just said about they do exist reminds me of that Eminem's Christmas commercial where <laughs> Santa comes down the chimney and sees the the big Eminems <laughs> anthropomorphize. They do exist, they and do. you know, and and I yeah, I think that uh, that part of that is starting with 
going, going backwards. What is the outcome that you want? What is, what is the thing that would make your life easier? Oh, it would make my life easier if when I had volunteers log their hours, they could write me a note about something that happened during that shift. Okay, I don't know what I'm looking for. I don't know what kind of tool I'm looking for, but I know what I want it to do because I know the data that I'm looking for. So, right, like we don't track data just for funsies. We track data because it's useful, because it, it helps us, uh, you know, prove that we are tying our volunteer roles to the mission of our organization. It helps us uh, report back to our community members that this is how effective and amazing we are. So you really need to start backwards, or that's what I always do, start mm -hmm. backwards. And, and then go back from there and just figure out, talk to people. You know, there are so many amazing groups of, of, of people. And this is not just people that you already know, but find strangers on the internet who'd be willing to talk to you like us. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's Facebook groups for leaders of volunteers. There's Twitter. I cannot tell you the number of people who I have first met on Twitter and then get to meet in in person, in real life, eventually. But, you know, it started because I had a question about something related to, you know, engaging volunteers. And I just put it out there in the world and and the universe brought me back, you know, an amazing connection. And there's, there's uh, you know, LinkedIn groups too, if that's more your style, or even there's some on Instagram that I've been able to find and connect with. And of course, your local volunteer managers association or, you know, a live or VMPC, you know, so definitely just ask around. And then another one that I find that a lot of leaders of volunteers don't necessarily know about, which is an amazing organization, is the Nonprofit Technology Network. Oh, it's yeah, like, for sure. It's they have they have um, uh, message boards that you can access for free. You you just get a free membership for the message boards, and then you can ask people who, you know, a lot of the people in there. It's their job to know nonprofit technology and nonprofit. I want to say is inclusive of government organizations too, right? right. Because right. You know, in terms of what we're doing and who we're serving, and and. That. And anyone who's really engaged in volunteer services is going to use this technology. I mean, on the corporate end, it tends to be things like Benevity that are tied into employee engagement. And there's certain, you know, three or four companies that kind of dom dominate that space. But whether I've introduced the idea of volunteer management software to longstanding city agencies, nonprofits that have existed for decades that you're like, huh, how do you, how do you just stay in this little non-tech bubble for 40 or 50 years and then emerge because like it's a always been stuff. that way. Yeah, I know. It's always been, yeah. <laughs> Hashtag it's always been done that way. If we could, yes. <laughs> we could like put that toothpaste back in the tube of like, no, it doesn't have to always be, be done that way. And Oh, exactly. It, it's just amazing to me. I think you and I, did we cyber stalk each other on Twitter? That was, I mean, it's been some years. So I'm trying to think back to probably <laughs> something like that. One of the things that I've spoken about in webinars and workshops that is even more your expertise. So I'll, I'll toss the, the topic over to you is how do how do we social media as leaders of volunteers do we let volunteers do it do we not let volunteers like these are the questions that come up over and over and over again and i know i know the answers but what are some again non-scary ideas uh, that you have around use of social media which audiences go with which platforms any insights on on that deep dive we'll be here for another i've stunned hours. you into i know it's like oh we only have about 17 more hours to yeah <laughs> it could it could be its own top we're acknowledging this could be you know many many weeks of learning and and yet <laughs> yeah yeah i know it's uh you know, I think of the people who say, oh, no, we can't trust volunteers with social media. And it's like, you, you, did you know that there are volunteers doing incredible things, saving people's lives, doing, you know, firefighting and search and rescue and all these things. And, oh, you can't trust them with your Twitter? Okay. Yes. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Does not compute. 
Yeah, there's uh, something that I've heard um, or read uh, Rob Jackson write about, which is the difference between risk management and risk avoidance. And a lot of right. times we think we're doing risk management, but we're actually just avoiding the risk entirely. Mm -hmm. And I think that happens a lot with social media because people, you know, when, when something goes bad, it can go bad real fast and it's big, it can be very, very visible, right? And, you know, it can go viral and... Um, but I, I think with any volunteer role, it's all about finding the right person, giving mm -hmm. them the right support, and then getting out of the way. You know, there are so many um, organizations that have done, uh, they have specific social media channels that are run by teen volunteers, and right. they're for teens, you know, yeah. so like, get out of the way. Yeah. Um, you know, if you feel like this isn't your area of expertise, figure out what your part of it is, and, the, and then let you know, provide the space for people to step into that and, and take over because then they're going to, they're going to feel like they're a part of what you're doing. You know, that's what we all want people to do is to be able to take some ownership without taking too much. Right. That's always mm -hmm. a balance, you know, so having the guardrails on, on there and maybe you start a little more, you know, with more guardrails or uh, more bowling lane bumpers, whatever your preferred <laughs> <laughs> metaphor but, metaphor of the inter interwebs of series of tubes yes <laughs> exactly exactly you know but but then be able to build that relationship with that volunteer or that group of volunteers and be able to step back you know and, and I think that that is different in every organization if you have you know if you don't have a marketing and communications department then it's going to look really different than an organization that does have somebody running all your social media, or maybe they even have a whole team doing that. And so it's really just about finding your spot where you can kind of wiggle a little bit and make some space for folks and, to do. That. And if it gets a totally true, and when it feels overwhelming for companies to, if or little organizations, big or small, or sometimes entirely volunteer run organizations where maybe there's one part-time paid administrator or one part-time paid executive director to kind of, you know, keep things on track for mm -hmm. logistics. Sometimes you can, I mean, there's also, there's, there's companies that do these services for you. There's Taproot, uh, there's Compass Point. There are organizations that help provide not just via volunteer match or, or larger recruitment platforms, but very highly skilled pro bono. And one of them is Tech for Good. So yep. related to, you know, NTech and you and I are presenting at 2021 NTech. So high five, virtual high five for that. Uh, did that work? Did we high five? A little bit. Well, I think, I think we, you one, have to look at the two, elbow. Three, there we go. Yes, <laughs> with Zoom lag, high, high five. Uh, and that there's there's tech soup, there's tech for good, there's that specifically are around that kind of volunteerism and and highly skilled, highly specialized uh, backgrounds and, and people to fit into projects. And then you know stuff like Taproot, where it's any kind of very high highly spe highly specific skill. Doesn't mean the skill is high or low, but a very specifically skilled person and the time it takes to to fit them to you if you as a leader of volunteers don't have time to go looking for that completely from scratch. It's like, again, there's a whole community, there's all these support systems, there's all these other apps and side businesses and organizations that exist to solve these problems and just reach out for help. And like you said, put it out on a forum, put it out on, on a tweet of like, yeah, I don't know how to solve this. Um, a lot of times I'm answering threads on the socials where it's like, hey, I know someone who just happened to do a webinar in that, or I just happened to do a webinar in that, or Liza just happened to do a webinar, and here's the link. And they're like, oh, yep. I, it's like, yay, you've just, you know, you've done some something really great to to pay it pay it forward for people. And and speaking of that, and there's also that kind of limbo land of if you, Liza, as the expert, do not have time to train or supervise or design the training for volunteers or even paid staff to learn new technology, how can you, how can you kind of set them up so that that process becomes automated or, or you can delegate it to people who can take that on to, to get everyone bought in, to get all the stakeholders uh, on, the, on the same page? Yeah, that's a good one. So um, one thing, 
that I actually just saw that, you know, as talking about uh, volunteers with a very specific skill set is that also universities are often looking for uh, placements for their students who, you know, are maybe looking for an academic year length project and they can give you four to six hours per week and maybe you engage a student to be able to develop the social media strategy and to build all of the the training and you know you work with them and at the end they have this amazing product and a lot of times you know they're they need to do that for credit or there's some sort of um, set up where the school is paying them. So they're a volunteer for your organization, but they are getting compensated financially from their, from their university or college. Um, but they can help you set that up and then making sure that you know how to update that. So if they're writing an instruction manual of here's the process and, you know, here's where all the passwords live and, making sure that you have the access to that and um, that if things need to be updated, <laughs> that you know how to do it because not otherwise... Just, are you saying not sticky notes on the computer screen that says the password is password with some dollar signs? Is that what not to do? Yeah, it, it, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but... and And I think there's just a lot of... Uh, a lot of times when we get really excited about something and we let somebody run with it because like, oh, I don't know how to do that. I'm just going to let them run with it. And then once they're done, I don't know what to do with it now. I don't know how to explain it. You know, so, so, you know, it, it's the sort of thing where anytime somebody says like, oh, I don't have the time to learn that I, I hear, oh, it's not a priority. You know, mm. if you, if you had, if that was a priority, you would have time to learn that. I, I know that that feels so impossible and I don't want to place that judgment on, on folks, but I, I do think that if it's important, you just gotta, you gotta figure it out. You gotta make yeah. the time or find somebody who can make the time. And I think that, you know, the, the way that our, uh, our workforces, whether it's paid or unpaid, there's a certain amount of turnover. So don't, you know, create something and then have it all in your brain. And then when you leave or you win the lottery, then, oh, poof, that knowledge is gone. So make sure that you are writing it down, maybe even as you're doing it, because that can help you. And also if your project stalls and then you can't get back to it, for a year because, oh, maybe a pandemic happens or something. <laughs> for example, go back. just as a random hypothetical example, yes. Exactly. <laughs> you know, that you can, you can go back to it. You can, you can pick up where you left off. So don't let that knowledge just be in your head or be in, uh, you know, somebody else's head and without you having access to it. You know, we're not living in the matrix, unfortunately. We can't just download all the information that we want. Mm -hmm. As I would like that sometimes. <laughs> exactly. Or just, you know, eat a fantastic steak that has no calories and no cholesterol. <laughs> right. All of that. All of that good stuff. Uh, and yeah. I think it's also important for people to understand, and you've made this point in many of your talks and blogs before, that um, setting up a training or kind of placeholding or figuring out a guideline along the way, like, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect and polished and the be all end all, it can be, you know, a screenshot, a meme. Like I, even a few years ago, as I was um, leaving my then full-time job with the conservation agency to work for myself, I gave them seven months notice, but in updating the training, cause we did have a bunch of new software that a new person in my role is gonna inherit. I just, I, I like, I'm on a Mac, but I, you know, can control you know option control forward everything i screen capped every moment because i'd rather have spend 10 minutes screen capping a hundred different things and only need 20 of them than to try to go back later and figure it out it's like as i'm learning this i'm just like or recording on zoom or just recording in facetime you know it can be 30 seconds of like hey this is how this works mm -hmm. you know, go here if you need extra help and the fact that there are so many 
so many YouTube videos on how stuff works, either by the companies that make the stuff in the machines and the software. Uh, if they don't have it on their website, I know Better Impact is great at having those kinds of tutorial videos. I think they're, they're the best of the VMSs around the world to have easy to use stuff and videos on how easy it is to use their stuff and then people to call if you still have questions about their stuff. Um, but I have solved many a difficulty with a three to five minute, you, watching a three to five minute YouTube video. What have been some of your favorite kind of shortcuts to, to communicating a couple of training points to people other than my Tuesday tips? Of course. Yeah, I love screen caps. They're my go-to. I'm just such a visual person that if you, you know, wrote out an entire list of how to do something from step one to step 20, and I looked at it, and then I looked at whatever I was trying to do, I would probably, it would take me a while because I got to go back and forth and back and forth. But with a video, I can have it playing, and then I can be doing that at the same time. And so it's, it's show and tell, you know, so I think having that in a variety of um, formats can really help whoever you're trying to help learn is, you know, maybe somebody is more of a, a list person. Great. Have it in a list, but then break it up with your screen caps as you go. Um, another one that I love is doing screen casts. So it's literally just me recording on my screen and then go over and click on this button and then I actually do it. <laughs> yeah, you know, and that doesn't have to be super duper professional. You don't necessarily have to have a script. Um, I am pretty notorious for, you know, having garbled up words and then I feel like, oh no, I messed that up and then I start swearing and, you know, but that's how I learned editing. So. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to editing so to, to video uh, and media multimedia editing software. Cutting your own rants out. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I do that as well. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and you know, just being able to um, have another thing which is called an explainer GIF. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say GIF. We're not going to get into no, that. No, no, no. It's but... GIF. It's GIF. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm I'm with <laughs> you on that. I I'm not. Yeah, I'm with you. GIF. Yes, I, I knew I liked you, Dana. Um, so, <laughs> Yay. so explainer gifts, they're basically videos that are on loop, you know, just like your, you know, a meme gift that you see and, but it's you doing the same action over and over and over again. And so perhaps the action is you're clicking on some text and then dragging it into another place or something like that. And then it just loops back in like, all, all over and over and over again. And that has really been helpful in training staff because um, a lot of times I'm training staff on how to use our volunteer database and being able to say like, here's this, and they don't have to rewind that 15 second part of the training video is really helpful. But again, if you have the capacity to do multiple things, and yeah, do multiple ways of training because the whole the whole spray and pray method doesn't really work. You know, <laughs> you spray the same thing on a group of people and pray that it lands, and that's not always going to be the case. So you've got to provide different ways for people to learn, and and recognizing that people are going to learn in different ways. That's you know that's how we are. Yeah, so. I think I think spray and pray only works when with like a muddy dog in the yard. That's that's where I'm like. <laughs> Time for the hose, little ginger. Yes. Sorry, you've been playing in too many mud, mud puddles in the rain. Time for the hose. And it, this gets into another incredibly important topic. And thank goodness people have, not just in our sector of volunteer engagement, but really everywhere have been awakening to the necessity of accessibility and the pandemic, not just the digital divide, which we talk, talked about um, earlier in this interview, but just accessibility for sight impaired, hearing impaired, mobility impaired, neurodivergent, different learning styles, even if it's not classified as intensely as neurodivergent, it's, it's a, you know, I have a learning style that is sound. We're in my music room. That's, that's my wiring is if I listen to something 
I probably and I'm interested in it. I'll probably remember it. Uh, and I don't do well with a lot of busy graphics or understanding pictures to convey an idea. And I have plenty of colleagues who are absolutely the opposite. If I give them a wall of text or a sound or a video or a podcast, they, they fall asleep or they tune out. They have to see a lot of different colors and a lot of different shapes to differentiate the ideas. So what what's kind of fun and exciting accessibility or what have you noticed, again, in the pandemic pivot, pros and cons of, of more or less accessibility using technology? Yeah, I think there's definitely much more of an awareness of people who don't have accessibility needs to the, the, uh, the do, that people do have accessibility needs. So I think that's definitely become a lot more um, obvious to people and, you know, software it, to be able to caption things has mm -hmm. really, you know, taken off. And so it's always interesting to see how things auto caption. Right. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> like funny. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was, I was watching the inauguration. Um, and I was also on a meeting, but I so I had the inauguration playing on my other laptop and um, had just the captioning on and I noticed it said Vice President Heretics. And I'm like, <laughs> what? So then, you know, my, my mind had to go back and be like, oh, okay, that was just YouTube auto captioning. It must have been, right? And so, you know, definitely if you're going to use technology to auto caption, go back and check it. Make sure that it says what you want it to say. Um, that's a great opportunity to engage volunteers because they can go and they can you know, if you have folks who want to do something from home, mm -hmm. have them listen, have them watch the video and make sure that it's correct. If you have a script that you can provide for them too, they can check it against that. Yep. So definitely that's an opportunity. And, and we were talking about universal design before, but the, the idea of having things captioned is not just for people who are not able to hear what you're saying, but it's for people, you know, Maybe it's somebody like I do this when my toddler is falling asleep and I'm, you know, he won't let me leave the room because then he'll wake up and I'm like, I'm bored. So I want to watch a video. I'm not going to watch with sound on. So okay. the captioning, you know, just helps me to be able to, you know, find out what that local nonprofit is talking about because they captioned their video. So that's just one example of universal design is that it was designed for people who are deaf or who have um, different um you know, hearing related um, things that they need the captioning for, but it works for all of us. This idea that um, universal design and accessibility for all has become kind of one of my catchphrases the last few years because it really benefits everybody. If, if some jerk is in a corner complaining because uh, the ramp got the snow shoveled up to the library before the stairs did, it's like, dude, you can use the ramp. Like that helps everybody. That That's yep. kind of the classic cartoon or graphic around illustrating the access for all and, and universal design is like, hey, everyone can use the ramp. Only a limited number of people can use the stairs. So how are we going to prioritize this design? How are we going to prioritize how, how we treat folks? I had a, uh, an intern, a high school intern with a previous agency over the summer get so excited to convert some of our our booth outreach kids games with braille and we had been meaning to do this for years and all it took was like someone who's who's interested that i can just say here's the resources to get here's the resources here's the budget it doesn't cost much there's again agencies nonprofits that will for very very little money convert any text to sticky braille things that you can put on stuff and usually you go through your lighthouse or center for the blind or or even the va to find where those nonprofits are the services are and that was i was so excited for that project everyone else in the office was like well that's pretty cool and you know you know we as as people with pretty good sight and vision um abilities yeah that's nice that you did that and i was like no you don't understand how much this opens up our community engagement it opened it was the one thing that was missing from the rest of our of the games were designed for no or low 
English language skills. They were picture based, you know, pictures of animals, a picture of a house, a picture of a baby rattle, like what's the baby animal, those kinds of games, mix and match or, or um, flip, picture flip tile games, mem memory, memory challenge, Ugh. speaking of memory challenge, but just putting sticky braille stuff on that. I think the whole thing costs under 50 bucks to do all of the games for all of the agency and we would do two or three booth events a day each day of the weekend almost every weekend all year round mm -hmm. yeah why not why, why, why not, not do it? why not do that why why not do that um yeah am amazing uh any closing thoughts or summary of what could be many many weeks of classes that you could run <laughs> on this topic so sorry to limit you to, to an hour or less of, of our full chat but uh, yeah any anything in, in closing or summary that you would like to share with our priceless advice audience I think one thing I wanted to say in terms of getting buy-in is that one trick that I learned from a colleague that has worked really well is that I sent out a survey to folks who are doing volunteer coordination throughout my organization about what they wish our volunteer management system, our VMS could do. Mm -hmm. And I included things that our current system does. And I included things that other systems that I was looking at could do. I didn't include things like a unicorn brings you a cupcake every Tuesday morning. You know, I'm not Why gonna- not? <laughs> <laughs> that's my dream but you know I didn't include things that were not remotely possible and that puts me into the great position of being able to go back to them and say hey here's what you said and here's what we're getting we we took this into consideration in a huge way this wasn't just us asking and like oh yeah, we didn't really care because we already knew what we were going to do. But it's like, no, we, we thought about you. Mm -hmm. You are important to us. We value your opinion and not just, you know, oh yeah, we value your opinion. But no, we really value your opinion because you are going to be using this. And in order for us to collect the data that we want and for people to use it, it's got to work. Yeah. And so, you know, so I really loved being able to do that. And I think that in, in volunteer engagement, we, we like to say yes. We like to say, yeah, we can do that for you. And so this is an opportunity to do that. And then through that, I also said, you know, if you have other things that you want to talk about and we can set up a time to chat, mm -hmm. then, you know, th those, that's kind of how I identified my amazing squeaky wheels. They were the mm -hmm. people who cared enough to say, yeah, our current system is not great for how I use it, you know, with teen volunteers or Spanish speaking volunteers. So I want to talk to you about that. And that's how I was able to, you know, find more, um, more uh, information from the people who it hasn't been working for, you know, and that's who I'm going to put at the center of, of our, of our priorities because they haven't had it work for them for so long. So I really liked that tip, but I guess the other thing I would say is, uh, don't be afraid to reach out to somebody. It's okay to say, you know what? Technology is really hard for me. I have no idea what I'm doing. What I want is this, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I think our emotions are very attached to our decision-making and that includes decision-making around technology. And then lots of people have lots of emotions. Uh, so it's okay to have that. So technology can be emotional and that's okay. So. Yeah. And, and I think, we've i hope and i've experienced myself and, and witnessed that there's been that growth of compassion and grace and patience around technology and learning new things and seeing where agencies and individuals do really well adapting to stuff but then you know not being judgmental and not ever shaming which we should never do but i've i've really been pleasantly surprised by how well a lot of colleagues and agencies have just very gently shifted to technology without, you know, throwing people and volunteers or other team members into the deep end of the pool and watching them just really, really struggle because no one wants to fail. So this is about, it's kind of like the Scotty Star Trek thing of like, oh, the engines can't take anymore. Like, you know, un under, 
you know, overestimate how hard it will be and then like deliver the easy <laughs> results yeah. and, you know, set and, and meet or exceed those expectations. And if you tell people what they want to hear instead of what's realistic all the time, that's setting everybody else, that's setting everyone up to be disappointed or setting people up to not succeed. No one wants to fail. That's a terrible feeling. Yeah. No one, yeah, wants, for sure. no one wants to be embarrassed that they don't know something that's a terrible feeling. So mm -hmm. how can we gracefully say, oh, you know what? You know, uh, yeah, I didn't know this until somebody told me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, exactly. And it's also an awesome opportunity for you to get those those volunteers or staff who are, who are excited about the technology, right. get them in first. And sure. then they can mentor and coach other people who are not as comfortable, you know? And like, it, it's all about relationships. Everything is, you know? Uh, hashtag, it's all about relationships. <laughs> <laughs> well, I value our relationship, Liza, even though we don't see each other in person nearly as often, but I hope that uh, healthcare technology and efforts and public health efforts uh, are such that sometime in 2021, uh, we can see each other in person again safely and visit. And thank you so, so much for sharing your tech talk wisdom on priceless advice and your wonderful Tuesday tips and enjoy your library. It looks like you have a lot of books to read. So I think you're really well set up. I do. My, my TBR pile is, you know, very, very long, but um, yeah, thank you so much, Dana. This has just been um, amazing to be able to nerd out and to like, Oh, I can talk to you about technology. You're there. You're not going to walk away. You're like, Mrr. <laughs> you know, when I get a little too nerdy. So I really appreciate you. And um, yeah, I hope this is helpful for folks. And if they want to reach out and talk nerdy, I would love to do that. Yeah, yeah. Talk, talk nerdy to Liza. Talk nerdy to me. We dig it. We're into it. We're here to help you. This whole community is here to help you. There's whole industries and companies here, here to help you. So uh, we will... Take in this wonderful priceless advice and stay warm and dry where you are and I shall as well. We'll talk to you again real soon. Thanks.